to everybody here and everybody uh, listening into this uh, broadcast. Nice to have you. Welcome to those of Christian Coffee Time. Get your pens and papal papals, pens and papers ready. <laughs> Jot down the things that we're going to talk about here. We're in the book of John, chapter six, and we're going to try and finish up this morning this uh, section. Uh, that we don't find in the other three Gospels. If we're going through the Gospels chronologically, and the Lord Jesus is talking about the uh, um, the bread of life, okay, and he's I'm going to finish it up here. There's some interesting. It's always interesting. Every portion of the Scriptures is interesting. Amen. 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 All right. So let's uh, just have a little word of prayer, and we'll get going here. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this time, and uh, Lord, we just we need your help. We need your help to hear, to listen, to understand. And Lord, I need your help that, that you give me the words to bring forth here for us, Lord. And we just pray that you be honored and glorified in this. And uh, Lord, we thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so and we get to verse, uh, we're at verse 53. So we're going to do from 53 to the end. But at verse 53, the Lord Jesus brings something out that is um, absolutely... Um, I was going to say hard to grasp. For some, it's hard to grasp. And we talk about that. That's what this bit is all about. But he really gets down to the uh, nitty gritty here. There's some things here that are mentioned about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Whereas uh, people today, even they look at that and they they make faces about that. What's that all about? Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso Eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. And he goes on to talk about the uh, his flesh and his blood and drinking it. And this is the way of salvation and so on and so forth, the way to have everlasting life. Just a little bit of a side note, there are those uh, around about that take this portion of scripture and they'll take, try and make it kind of a literal thing. Now we know that the Lord Jesus is talking about a, um, a spiritual principle, spiritual teaching here. It's not an actual physical thing he's talking about. Like when Jesus says, I am the door, he's not really a door. It's a, he uses things in life that we can understand things easily. And this is a fascinating portion of scripture in that we'll see who, did, who understood and who didn't and why. He tells us why they aren't getting it. Um, there are some that take this and, and they say that and they have uh, the wafers and stuff cookies, whatever they are, and they say that these things tur actually turn into the blood, uh, the wafers turn into the actual body of Jesus Christ, and uh, the wine or grape juice turns into the blood of Christ. It comes from this portion of scripture here. Now, that's because uh, uh, they, they're not understanding that this is a spiritual thing he's talking about, not an actual thing. He's not taking a piece of his flesh and consuming it or anything like that. He's not talking about that. They call that transubstantiation, which really doesn't happen. They think by some magical incantation that these things happen. It does not. That's not what Scripture says. And if we follow through the rest of it here, don't just stop there on that portion. You'll see the, the, the whole truth of it. When you study the Bible, if you take one little portion um, without taking other portions that deal with that and shining light on that, you could end up in a bit of error, you know. There are some around that say back, and I think it's Ecclesiastes says, the dead know nothing. And they say, you see, soul sleep. Well, come on, why don't we take the rest of the verses in the Bible that, that talk about that, and then you'll get the, a complete picture. It's one of the uh, reasons we're going chronologically here. We're going through the Gospels chronologically, and we see that this section here in John chapter 6, and about the bread of life, is not in the other three Gospels. So if we take all of the, the Gospels, what all the Gospels say and put it together, you're going to have a, a, a quite a fantastic and fascinating uh, account and so on and so forth. So the Lord's bringing these things out. Now, if you just picture yourself being there and you hear this, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, for anybody that doesn't understand, uh, they're going to be horrified, do you think? <laughs> this is a difficult thing. Um, we have the Lord's table, we have that on a regular basis, and we have uh, um, a bread and the fruit of the vine, the grape juice, and these are symbols of Jesus Christ's body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed, amen? Mm -hmm. 
Amen. We take that, and that's that's that doesn't save you, though, does it? Amen. It's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about that either. <clears throat> Excuse me. So from verse 50, uh, um, 53 down to verse 57, and he says, 57 says, As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to say these things, and then in verse 58, he says again, and he... Um, <clears throat> He says this particular thing that he said now, through this section, he says this nine different times. Okay, verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. He says that nine times. Now, in the Bible, nine is the number of fruit bearing. Okay? But um, we talked about last week, I remember Willie Mullen talking about it, a great Irish preacher, one of my favorite preacher anyways. Um, says that uh, we, we don't understand and we don't get the, uh, some of the, perhaps the expressions and such, maybe the tone of voice or the uh, movements and such. When the Lord Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the, and the Jews and, and such, and he was talking about um, um, destroy this temple. He's standing at the temple. He says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He probably pointed to himself or went like this or something like that, eh? Amen. Probably did. And I think he did the same thing right here because he's talking about the bread of heaven, the bread of heaven, the bread of life. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he says, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Do you think? We aren't told that. We have to kind of read it into it. But when you stop and think about it, if you don't have that, it would almost seem like that verse is just disconnected, sort of. In my mind, anyways. He says, this, what's he referring to? The this, to himself. They're standing there, the disciples, there's the 12 disciples, and there's all those ones from Capernaum, they're all standing around. Actually, they were in the synagogue, weren't they? And uh, he says, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Now, just stop and think about it for a minute. This is the bread that came down from heaven. He's declaring and showing deity. Mm. This is God that came down, because only God can give eternal life. Amen? Amen? So that's what he's saying. That's what he's declaring by saying that. Now, you watch this as it goes on here, and something in, some interesting things come out of this. Not as your fathers did eat manna. We did that earlier. We did that last week in a, in a few verses before this. They ate manna and died off. They didn't enter into rest, and they're dead. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This is a spiritual thing. He's not talking about physically eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's just a foolishness. It's a spiritual thing. But note verse 59, he says, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This is the Passover. Back in um, verse 4, it said that the, the Passover of the Jews was nigh at hand. Now, the Lord Jesus and the twelve disciples were in Bethsaida near Julian, which is at the top on the, on the east corner there of uh, the Sea of Galilee, where they'd gone over there. And he had the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place there. And then <clears throat> he sent the disciples, twelve of them, in the boat. It shows you how big the boat was, too. It took twelve of them, they, and they would row by pairs. But they would go back across, and he came walking across the water, uh, and you know the whole account. We, we looked at that. The Lord Jesus wanted to get to Capernaum. Why? Because the Passover was time was coming up, and there was nothing going to keep him away from that. There should be nothing that should keep us away from the things of God too. And they're, but at this point, they're in the synagogue at Capernaum. And the twelve disciples were over there with him, and they saw those miracles that he did there with the feeding and so on and so forth of the five thousand. When he gets back over there, there's all kinds of disciples around him in the synagogue and around that followed him. As we see that right here in the next verse, in verse uh, um, verse sixty, right there, it says, "Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, 'This is a hard saying. Who can hear it?'" Now, you've got to keep in mind, 
there was only 12 of the disciples went with him over on the boat and back, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a, a many, many others that followed him. Now the word disciple itself, the word disciple there um, has the idea of somebody um, uh, um, learning or it's one who follows a teacher with an endeavor to learn and to apply those things, okay? It's not just hearing it, but wanting to apply it to their lives. So there was, just get this picture. There's the Lord Jesus, there's the 12 disciples, and there's a, what he calls many other disciples. Right there in the synagogue, in that area of Capernaum. And they're listening to Jesus, they want to hear what he's got to say. But I wonder if, uh, where their hearts, well, the Bible tells us where their hearts were. It says, uh, uh, many therefore, verse 60, many of his disciples, when they had heard this, heard this thing about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, they said, this is a hard saying. Who could hear it? Now that word hard right there is an interesting word. It's a word skleros. And where we did derive, or another word is derived from that was skelos, meaning to dry, be dry to the touch, and there'd be no substance to dry it up. So actually, the skelos is where we get our English word skeleton. Okay? It's just, there's nothing to it. It's not something attractive. It's not something I can, I, I, I don't want, I don't want that. It's exacting, it's harsh, it's severe. It's hard to understand. Many of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Now that word here, we talked about that uh, uh, um, last week. They heard the words of the Lord Jesus, but they did not understand. The same as in Acts 22.9, when the, the ones that were traveling with the Apostle Paul up to Damascus, they, they saw the light and they heard the voice, but they did not perceive what the message was. Sometimes people hear the things of God. They can hear the words. They just don't get it. There's just no understanding. You know what I mean? So many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, and we have that word again that was earlier, that that grumbling, now, you note here, he's talking to and referencing the disciples, not the twelve disciples. The ones in the synagogue are the ones that are having a problem here. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? Does this offend you? That word offend is where we get our word scandal from, scandalos, word scandal. This to them, to hear, eat my flesh and drink my blood, they didn't understand. It was like, it was a scandalous thing to hear. It was a difficult thing to hear. It's something that would cause them to be offended, be, to be tripped up. They're having trouble with this. But remember, what was the point of this? And what's he saying about eat my flesh and drink my blood? And he talks about it nine times. He says, this is the bread that which came down from heaven. He's talking about his deity, the deity of Christ. Because we know that in verse uh, 62, uh, when we get to this one, uh, we see, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he, he asks them, does this offend you? Does this teaching, that this, this thing that I'm bringing forth, does this offend you? And he says, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? Whoa, look at that. He said, what if you saw what if you actually saw me ascending up into heaven? That's going to happen in uh, Acts chapter 1, isn't it? It's going to happen. He says, what if you saw this? Hmm. He's trying to get across to them. It's not about seeing. That would be an amazing thing to see that. Yeah. But it's not about seeing. And he goes on in verse 63. It's the spirit that quickens. You see, the disciples had trouble grasping and accepting the deity of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They didn't get it. And he shows us a little later on here why and how come. And it's, I find it fascinating. Remember nine times he says, this is the, the true bread from heaven. It came down from heaven, for I came down from heaven. 
The Jews murmured because he said, I am the bread, come down from heaven, etc., etc. He says, what if you see me ascending up to heaven? Well, that'd be something, all right. But it's not about that. It's not about uh, physically seeing things. It's not about physical things. These are spiritual things because he says in verse 63, it is the spirit that quickens. The spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that we're talking about here. Not that by seeing something, you're not going to see something. You're not going to have a sign. It's not by um, uh, eating the Lord's, at the Lord's table. It's not about some other wafers and some wine or whatever. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And the Spirit of God quickens the individual. Gives quicken. That word quicken means to give life. He says the, the flesh profits nothing. This is a spiritual truth, not a physical truth. And he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, spirit, and they are life. The very words of Scripture, the very words of the Bible, are spiritual, are alive. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. I told you about that preacher a very long time ago. There was a fellow in Toronto, apparently. It was a long time ago. I only heard about it. I was told. I didn't see it. This guy is out in the street preaching. Matt does. He's got his hat on the sidewalk. And he's jumping around and pointing at it. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And then people, the crowd starts going, what's under his hat? What's he got? It's alive. And he gets a crowd, takes the hat, puts it on his head, picks up, he says, this is the word of God. It's alive. And he starts preaching to them. Mm -hmm. That's a novel thing. You can try that one sometime. <laughs> but it is alive. He's saying these other things, and people try so hard to do this, to be this or, or whatever. I knock on doors. I go to church. I was baptized. I will fill in the blank. Whatever. He says, it's none of that. It's the Spirit. The Spirit of God. Remember last week we talked about Genesis chapter 1, the, uh, uh, the principle of salvation. The Spirit of God must move upon a person and the Word of God must be spoken and then you have the light. The light will enter. He says... Where are we? 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There's another declaration, declaration of deity right there. Mm. Who else could say that? That the words that I'm speaking to you are, the, are, are life, are alive. God's word. Because Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 64, but there are some of you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to disciples. Go back there, um, uh, verse 61, and he knew some of his disciples were murmuring and so on and so forth. Some of you believe not. Some of them didn't believe. Now he's going to tell us why they don't believe. You see why they couldn't understand this thing about this, the bread and, 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 and uh, uh, eating his flesh, rather, and the blood and the, and the bread from down from heaven and all these things, they, didn't, they couldn't grasp it because they didn't believe. There was something missing here. For Jesus knew from the beginning, ah, from the beginning, he knew all along. Of course he did. He knew from the beginning who they were that... Now he mentions not necessarily two different groups of people, but there's two different things mentioned here. First of all, he says, um, for he knew from the beginning who they were that... Believe not. Okay? He, I, I believe he's still talking about and he's still referencing his disciples. In amongst those that followed Jesus, he understood that there were some that really didn't believe. What were they there for? What were they in the synagogue for? What was going on? And secondly, and who should betray him? Now, when I read that, I think of. Um, the Lord Jesus being held by Pontius, what's his name? Pontius Pilate? What's his name? And the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. People have turned on him. I wonder if these ones would be there. But when we look down at the end of it, he talks about Judas who should betray him. So he's probably just talking about Judas, okay? Some of them uh, believe not and those who should betray him from among his disciples. Now look at this. In verse 65, 
And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. That's the Holy Spirit drawing somebody. We know that the Bible teaches us that when somebody hears the word of God, the gospel, and the Spirit of God presenting it, he will illuminate and enlighten the individual. Or if he chooses not to, that's up to him. Okay? That's what the book of Hebrews was about, right? Remember? Hebrews, they heard the word. They understood. They were enlightened. They saw. They understood. But they said, oh, not for me. Ooh. You know what that does right there to Calvinism? It destroys it. It destroys it because grace is resistible. Yep. In the book of Hebrews, they were resisting the grace of God and the Spirit of God. And I'll tell you something else. Now let's turn to the other end of the scale. Armenian is Armenianism <laughs> that they say, well, it's all by the will of man. Because I believe because I say this or I believe this, God has to move and it has to be so. It says here, and the Bible teaches us it's not by the will of man, nor by the flesh, but of God. John 1.13. Mm -hmm. It destroys both of those two extremes because salvation is neither of those. Okay? The Spirit of God moves upon an individual. The Spirit of God had not moved upon these individuals. Mm -hmm. Had not moved upon these ones that were walking away because they didn't understand. The ones in Hebrew understood and they still walked away. I find just fascinating. Except you were drawn by the, by the Spirit of God given unto him of my Father. The Spirit of God moves upon an individual and the Word of God is there spoken and the light enters, you see, now what? Now you have to believe. Mm -hmm. That's all your part. Of it. Just believe, accept it, trust Him. Receive Christ as Savior. These ones were going away because they just didn't get it. Well, the Spirit of God hadn't moved upon them. Do you ever try and witness to somebody? And they just don't get it and they don't want to hear it. I heard of uh, an individual that um, had looked at some of the, our Revelation series and said that's absolute utter nonsense. Okay, I understand, I understand what's going on. I don't take it personal, but I understand what's going on. That person has not been, had their mind open, their, their, their spirit, they've not been shown by the Spirit of God for one reason or another. People say, well, I'll just wait until my deathbed and I'll get saved because they want to live a, a, a wicked life and want to do all the things that they want to do, you know. And I, on my deathbed, I'll... <laughs> no, you won't. Unless the Spirit of God enlightens you and opens your understanding. That's the process here. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think, I think it's around verse 13. It talks about the uh, sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. Okay? The Spirit of God comes along and opens that understanding and such. And those people in the book of Hebrews were placed in a very precarious spot. If I can use that word, it may not be the right word. They, what, what they had understood and seen and they were illuminated now demands a response. And they were in danger of, the Spirit of God gives us the book of Hebrews and explains to us that there were some that were wanting to go back into Judaism. And give up. And he says, you'll damn yourself. You'll damn yourself. Okay? Salvation is a thing of God for mankind. Yes, we have to believe. We believe when the Spirit of God opens our understanding. That's just what the Bible says. That's what Jesus Christ says right there. The Gospel is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God which means that God manifests in the flesh, went to the cross of Calvary as a Lamb of God, as a sacrifice in your place, my place, and everybody's place to pay for your sins. We are all sinners. We all have the sins of Adam upon us. We have an old nature that does commit sin, and we have the uh, sins that are committed. And Jesus went and paid the price of all of that on the cross of Calvary, gave his life, shed his blood, 
was buried in the tomb, rose from the dead on the third day, and God just simply says, will you believe, will you trust in Jesus Christ? Do you remember when you got saved? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what preceded, if I put it this way, what went before you accepting Christ as Savior? He showed you your sins. You saw and you understood. I remember it very clearly. I saw my sins and myself as a sinner before God, undone, in a bad place, not the place I thought I was. It was, oh my, Lord Jesus, save me, forgive me. And you know what he'll do? He will. He'll Amen. save you. The gospel in a nutshell right there. So we see the Lord Jesus is trying to, I shouldn't say this, I shouldn't say he's trying to help them understand. They couldn't understand because, because of verse 65. It says in verse 66, uh, from that time, many of the disciples went back. Many of the disciples, all but 12. Wow. Mm. And walked no more with him. Sometimes people walk away from the church, they walk away from the Lord, they walk away from whatever, you know. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes there's things that draw us away. We get involved in the world too much. It gets in our heart and in our lives and we lose an appetite for the things of God. And we will fall away. You don't lose your salvation if you're saved, but you can go on a tangent off into, into a field somewhere out there away from God. Mm -hmm. You see, these ones... This one, these ones just didn't understand. They could not grasp the deity of Jesus Christ. And when we talk to people out there, we witness to people and such, you've got to remember that that's one of the things that we must get down to and stay with it, is the deity of Christ. Because you have everything but biblical Christianity is based on a work system and doesn't need the deity of Christ, they figure. Okay? But these ones could not grasp the deity. They could not accept. They could not understand because the Holy Spirit had not enlightened them to the truth yet. But they went to church. They went to the synagogue. From that time, many walked away and walked no more with him. It's kind of sad, isn't it? That's a lot of people. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, so you, can you picture in your mind, standing there and listening to that and watching Jesus and he's talking to them, and they turn and they walk away, and he turns to the twelve disciples. Verse 67, and Jesus said unto the twelve, including Judas, he's one of the twelve, will ye also go away? Jesus knew what they were going to say, he knew their hearts, but he wanted them to say it. Do them good to say it. It's like when some, you lead somebody to the Lord and you tell them, now you go witness to somebody. You find yourself at church. You find some believers that study the Bible. You get, and you get and tell people that you trust them in Christ. It's good for you. It's good for you to witness. It's good for you to hand a tract to somebody. It strengthens yourself, your own resolve inside. And Jesus, he knew what they were going to say. There's only 12 of them left. That's what it was. Will he also? And then Simon Peter answered. Peter is the one like the spokesman. He's always there up in the front. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of, of eternal life. Mm -hmm. The living word. The scriptures. The living word. The words from Jesus Christ. And the, the living word of Jesus Christ and the written word of God. And look what he says in verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. If you've noticed that our sign out front here has a, has a, a the verse Acts 8.37. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay. We are, I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But you won't find that, that particular verse in... Uh, uh, in what I call the corrupt Bibles, the minority text, 
It won't be, it won't be in there. Why would it be in there? Because it's so important. Mm -hmm. I studied this up and I was looking, <clears throat> sometimes I look on my phone, I've got a Bible program thingy there, which is a, an interlinear, Greek English, an interlinear. I look it up, I wanted to look up a word here, and look it up and, hey, it says something different than what's here. Now, normally I go by, I have a, a received text, is the, is the majority text uh, Bible. Look at that one on my phone. It has, you can be, be careful of the, uh, if you have that particular um, thing on your phone because it was not the received text and it does not say this. It does not say Christ, the Son of the living God. It says the Holy One of God. Mm -hmm. Well, angels are holy. You can say you're holy. But the received text, what God said, what the Spirit of God said, and we believe this, He said that what Peter said that day was, and we are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. That word sure is the idea of having known. And we recognize and we see and we understand that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're not going anywhere. Where could you go? When you get back to the book of Hebrews, that's what the Spirit of God wanted to hear from them. All those things He used in there to convince them that there's nothing to go back to. There's nothing to go back in Judaism or anything else or any other religion or anything. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. For all people of all time, you have to trust in Him. God gave Christ to the cross. He didn't give anything else or anybody else. We believe and are sure. Are you sure today? Do you believe that? And are you sure you're absolutely positive? You've received Him? You trust in Him? Make sure that you do. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Mm -hmm. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray Him, being one of the twelve. Fascinating portion of Scripture when you look at it and take it apart and to see what's going on here. Um, we see salvation. You can look those things up and you'll see that's exactly what takes place. Jesus Christ not talking about, of course he's not talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. That, that's nonsense. These are spiritual things. But sometimes we look at people and we get, maybe get upset with them. Maybe we might get a little bit put out by their attitude or whatever. They don't get it. They don't want to hear it. <clears throat> the Bible says that they think it's foolishness. <clears throat> the gospel is foolishness unto them. Because the Spirit of God hasn't opened their understanding yet. And there was a time when you and I had that same thing happen to us and we just didn't understand it. People came and they witnessed to us and they talked to us about <clears throat> Jesus. And we did, I want to hear that. Get me away from that. We ought not to be upset with them. We should uh, have that compassionate heart like the Lord Jesus has and understand that when we tell them and such, it may be a seed that the Spirit of God will use, and later on, God will bring them along. We don't know how it works. Our job is just to get the Word of God out there. And for those that know Jesus Christ and are saved, true born-again believers, this morning, this day, right here and now, give God thanks Amen. that you understand. Amen. It's a tremendous, tremendous privilege to be a born-again Christian. Amen. To be one that understands this book. Understands the things of God. And understands that others need Him too. We need to stop. Our time's gone. That's the uh, end of this portion. What we'll do is next week, uh, Lord willing, if we go back into the Gospels, we go back to Matthew chapter uh, 15. In there. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we just thank You for Your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your so great salvation. And, and to anyone, Lord, that will trust in Jesus Christ, to see themselves, Lord, as a, that, that sinner, undone before the Almighty God, but that Jesus Christ has paid for all of our sins on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your death on the cross, giving your life that we may live, and your rising from the dead, that it's been shown that the sins have been defeated. And death has been defeated, and that you indeed are the Son of God. 
So, Lord, we just thank you for your grace. Thank you, that Lord, that we can understand the Bible. And we pray for those around about us that maybe do not, Lord. And we just pray that you would use us to get the word out to them. That by chance, Lord, that you would be merciful unto them. That you be merciful unto our friends and families, Lord, that don't know you. And draw them to yourself, Lord. Bring someone alongside, maybe even today, that to share the gospel with them. Lord, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks.